I'm Christine, and I'd like to welcome you to Footnoting History's History for Halloween. This is our fifth year of bringing you little tidbits of the spooky, scary, and sometimes amusing, just in time for Halloween. They are, of course, all based on actual things reported throughout history, which is what makes them even more fun to talk about in October. I'm going to kick us off, as I typically do, before passing the baton to my colleagues, with a ghost story ripped fresh from the headlines of a historic newspaper. Recently, I was perusing the Easton Gazette out of Easton, Maryland from January 18, 1823, as of course, everybody does on a random evening in 2018. While doing this, I came across a story on the first page under the broader heading of Agriculture and Domestic Economy. It was mixed in among articles about things like how to select the best seeds, and how the best way to prevent apoplexy is to stop wearing such thick cravats. Look, I'll tell you what's not going to prevent apoplexy, and that's a ghost scaring the daylights out of you. So this article in the 1823 Easton Gazette was titled, A Well-Authenticated Ghost Story. So who isn't going to read it? Certainly I did, even though it was almost 100 years later. This haunting didn't actually occur in Maryland, but the newspaper tells us it is a retelling of a story from a London newspaper of the previous October. So let's see what the newspaper had in store for us after promising us that this ghost story was well authenticated. An old woman spends the latter part of her life entirely in bed. While there, she sits constantly in the same position, with her knees drawn up to her chest so that her chin comes very close, possibly even resting on them. She sits like this for so long that she finds it impossible to change positions, and her entire life's exercise is limited to rocking back and forth on the bed. Eventually, as is the way with all people, so the article assures us because we must never forget to ponder our own mortality, she passes away. Enter the ladies of her family as well as some of her acquaintances. They tend to the poor deceased old woman in all the proper ways and remain by her side meditating or praying or just simply visiting well into the night. But then the witching hour came. Cue the scary music, because here we go. The woman's sad quiet was torn apart by what sounded like a dreadfully loud peal of thunder. Horrified, they all looked to their recently departed friend and saw the unthinkable. She was sitting up in her famous old position and rocking back and forth like a seesaw without any indication that something was amiss and she was supposed to be dead. The article doesn't say that anybody screamed, but I'm hoping that somebody did because that's the must have in any horror story. What it does say is that, quote, this sight was beyond the endurance of any female fortitude, and the whole party rushed out of the room without politeness enough to wish the old body joy on returning to its customary occupation. So, sorry ladies, because in the past apparently our ladies there were too terrified to offer their congratulations to their friend on rising from the dead. How rude of them. They went to the undertaker. After all, it was his job to deal with this sort of thing and he had to go and see what exactly was going on in this room. When he entered, the reanimated corpse was still doing exactly what the women had told him, sitting there, knees up, rocking back and forth. He was probably a little freaked out, even though the article doesn't say that, but he was determined to investigate this situation. And after a bit of poking around the room, he realized it was not supernatural powers bringing the poor old woman back to life. Instead, he told the, quote, terrified feminines, end quote, which by the way, I think would make a really great name for a band, that what they actually saw was that there had been rocks on the woman's body in order to help her remain flat 
in that typical dead body pose after so many years of existing in a bent up form. Now, these rocks had somehow come loose and fallen off, causing the body to spring back up into its most common pose, therefore terrifying them because they thought she was actually alive. The woman was not alive again at all, but her body was so accustomed to its bent knees arrangement that it automatically returned to that same position when it was freed from its rocks. Whether this disappointed the women or relieved them, I can't say, because the article tells us nothing else. But it certainly gave them a good enough story to have it printed in more than one country. I'm Lucy, and this year, my bloody, blood-chilling Halloween footnote comes from my new home state of Iowa, from the town of Villisca. To this day, the unanswered questions about the Villisca murders are as notable as the facts. It was a sensational affair. Eight people brutally murdered, and their faces covered by their murderer. A town outraged and in arms, and no resolution to the question of who, in a small town or passing through on the railroad, committed the crime, leaving behind a basin filled with bloody water, the axe used in the killings, and, most strangely of all, a slab of bacon. Locally, it is a celebrated event. Several amateurs have devoted decades to the mystery, but it has defied historical investigation. The facts, insofar as they are known, are these. In 1912, after a Presbyterian ice cream social, the Moore family returned home with their own four children and two girls who wanted to sleep over. Sometime in the early hours of the morning, they were killed. When a neighbor was concerned at not seeing them awake and about, several officials went to investigate and found the bodies, slaughtered and shrouded, found the mirrors in the house draped, found lamps placed at the foot of the beds. Reportedly, horrified bystanders were warned not to enter, not for the sake of preserving the crime scene, but for the sake of preserving themselves from nightmares. Such warnings were not heeded. Furor swept the village and its surroundings. Posses were formed, bloodhounds loosed. Accusations flew. A federal criminologist arrived to attempt to clear up the intrigue and was run out of town by angry locals calling him a drunk. Four years later, local authorities hired the National Detective Agency to investigate. They, in turn, hired a former attorney. He accused a sausage stuffer, and the sausage stuffer accused William Mansfield, a labor organizer. Even under the third degree, he refused to confess. A jury acquitted him. He went free, and the attorney alleged that the jury was fixed. A second trial heard more than a hundred witnesses and found nothing. It was not until 1917 that the man treated by more recent records as the most likely suspect was arrested. George Lynn Jacqueline Kelly was a Presbyterian minister. He was also a suspected arsonist and a convicted sexual predator. The state's argument was that he was motivated by sexual fantasies. Kelly's argument was that he had done it because God had told him to suffer the little children to come unto him. As for the ineffectual attorney, his career ended in scandal and his life at a carnival. Mansfield was accused of murder, and Frank Jones, a senator accused of the crime, remained a prominent figure in Villisca until his death. What I find most suspicious, both as a historian and as a near lifelong reader of mystery novels, is the breathtaking thoroughness with which evidence was destroyed, neglected, or never collected in the first place. The coroner, required by law to investigate all unexplained deaths, didn't take notes on the condition in which the bodies were found. Townspeople overran the house. The extent to which the artifacts of the scene, the bloody bowl, the axe itself, the grotesque slab of bacon, were meddled with is unclear, and whether this negligence was, as I tend to suspect, willful, or merely the response of a small community 
to a shocking crime, it has effectively ensured that Velisca's so-called murder house will keep its secrets. Hello, Footnoting History listeners. I hope you're enjoying our tales of the macabre. What's that? You'd love to learn some more? Well, don't worry. As your host, Elizabeth, I have another story for you. You see, in an old building in London, not covered in vines, down a hallway known as the South Cloisters, there sits a cabinet. And within that cabinet sits a man. But don't be nervous. He won't pop and scare you because, you see, he's dead. And he's been that way for quite a long time. His name is Jeremy Bentham, and when he lived, he was considered a leading philosopher, and some say the father of utilitarianism, which is a theory that states that the best action is the one that maximizes the end result for most people, somewhat like a mathematical equation where one must subtract the potential suffering from the supposed benefit before being able to determine if an action is right or wrong. In addition to creating theories, Jeremy was a known atheist. He was also rather obsessed with what his body would be up to once he no longer kept it running. By age 21, Bentham was already trying to leave his body to family friends for dissection post-mortem. In high school, I had a history teacher who said she'd love to pickle my brain and see what made me tick. So perhaps Bentham hoped for similar answers, even if he wouldn't be around to know them. In 1830, two years before his death, Bentham laid out very specific instructions for turning his body into what he called an auto-icon, or a self-image, which he believed would serve as his memorial. When Bentham died, aged 84, his friends gathered for a small service in which one of them spoke over Bentham's naked body, which was covered only by a sheet. Then, his head and skeleton were preserved. Unfortunately, the preservation of the head, based on Maori traditions, did not leave Bentham looking his best. In fact, he looked rather desiccated. So a wax head with some of Bentham's hair was used instead. His real head was locked away to protect it from student pranks. His skeleton was dressed, with hay used to pad his clothing, and his remains were placed in the wood cabinet I mentioned earlier. The whole display is known as the auto icon. Until 1850, it belonged to a friend of his, but it was then bought by University College London where it normally sits down in the South Cloisters, except for three important anniversary days for the school when it was brought to a meeting of the College Council, and it was marked present but not voting. I hope, however, that you find yourself a little more lively at any meeting you have to attend this Halloween. If not, well, perhaps Bentham's post-mortem life will serve as a bit of inspiration. This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to visit our website, footnotinghistory.com, where you can find links to further reading suggestions related to this week's episode, as well as a calendar of upcoming podcasts. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. Until next time, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes.